and I'm an employee at the Department of Education, and I'm the project manager for the Digital Learning Task Force. And with me is John Marshausen, who's a superintendent of Loveland Schools, and he's a task force member. And this session is on Ohio's Digital Learning Task Force, um, which was authorized in legislative language, um, House Bill 153, um, just over the summer, actually, and we kicked off our work early fall. Um, what we want to share with you today are just a little bit of process and some of the preliminary recommendations that are kind of shaping up and take any of your questions, comments, feedback, it's all welcome, it's all a work in progress. So um, we invite anything that you'd like to share with us. So our actual charge is to develop a strategy for the expansion of digital learning in Ohio and you can see these three areas that were the focus of the legislators. Um, in particular, the context, what's driving this, uh, the legislators are really keyed into this idea that the world is changing and new sets of skills um, and, and new emphasis. We heard three in addition to achievement this morning, um, the global citizenship um, and the self-directed learning kinds of opportunities um, and how those are shaping business environments and certainly um, education environments. And so how do we craft those environments to keep pace if not lead this change? Um, within the task force charge uh, were different kind of focus areas and there's quite a laundry list of them, everything from like digital content to cloud computing to mobile devices, <laughs> plus the things that you would typically expect like how will you ensure a highly prepared workforce, how you um, allow for change to be constant so nothing becomes so institutionalized that um, you know it's not able to change whether in name or function or be disbanded over time. So the scope was, was pretty large, or is pretty large, I should say. You see their assessment accountability. Um, I think I've mentioned most of those other ones. Here are the official members. There are 11 of them. Um, and uh, there are two sitting legislators. Um, I'm looking to see, yes, Representative Derrickson is on there and Senator Peggy Lehner are our two sitting legislators. Gary Cates is a former legislator. Um, and Dan Bedea is serving um, in the place of Superintendent Hefner. Um, and then a number of superintendents um, from various size districts. Uh, we've had roughly eight meetings and part of our focus was to look at the Digital Learning Now report card, which is a policy report card that has 10 elements in it. Uh, addressing things like access and equity and infrastructure. Um, and those elements are coming from a, a nonprofit group, and that group has actually uh, rated states. They've rated all of the states on how much or to what extent, if you will, they've implemented these 10 elements, and you've got essentially an A, B, C, D rating. Um, we scored kind of middle of the pack, so we did all right, but there's lots of room for improvement. We had a couple of site visits. Um, you see there, one is kind of a career tech blended model, and the other one is the new tech um, school model, which is up in the Cleveland area. Um, I hear lots of complaints about the amount of reading that we <laughs> research reports and articles, and, and there's a lot in the news lately as well. So in terms of current events, um, they've heard quite a bit. And then they've had a number of guest speakers, um, and. Um, a lot of kind of bubble up information where people are forwarding either resources or ideas. Uh, certainly they were interested because of the shared services in both the Learn21 Consortia and the Spark Consortia. Um, and they did hear from the online teacher of the year, Kristen Kipp, um, who I understand is going to be returning to Ohio um, in August at the Innovation Conference. So I don't know if you want to do these questions, right? No, we're okay. Here. Well, so one of the big questions I get is, as a task force member is, what are you actually going to be recommending and what is this going to look like? Um, I'm going to talk to you now about eight areas that I believe recommendations will come from the task force. Please keep in mind that these areas are my opinion at this point. I do not represent the task force as a whole, and um, these will need to be agreed upon. This is. These are kind of my take on where things are at this point. Um, when we looked at the charge, one of the biggest challenges we had is what this conference is about, and that's digital, is about blended learning. Um, right now we have flex credit that would allow us to do things, but as a group, I get the feeling we want to make digital and blended learning more than permissible. We want to encourage it. 
and flex credit has run into its share of barriers as we move forward. So I believe that as a task force, we will be implementing a definition of blended learning and making that permissible under the current both administrative and revised codes so that school districts can do blended learning and not have to worry about things like seat time. Carnegie Unit is one of the largest barriers that we face when it comes to creativity, when it comes to blended learning and digital learning. Now, as a task force, we've had two conversations. One, do you remove the Carnegie Unit as a requirement for funding? Or two, do you come up with a definition for blended that is permissive for the different spectrums that we would have in blended learning and, and create kind of a separate category? I believe that's the direction that we're going. Um, it's been pointed out there could be a lot of unintended con consequences if you were to just remove Carnegie units from a requirement. So I believe one of the things you'll see is a definition of blended learning and a way for that funding to work in current public school systems. When you look back at the list of members of our group, there are several people who are from non-traditional schools or from e um, electronic schools. Um, as a public school superintendent, I get frustrated because they don't have to play by the same rules. So when it comes to blended, I want everybody to get to play by the same rules. I truly believe, and I, I say this over and over to people, there's lots of awesome things happening in public education. We just don't necessarily talk about it. I know in a lot of our schools, we're doing blended learning and we're following the premise of um, we're doing it and hope we don't get caught. We're doing it and we're coding kids the same. When, we, when people ask us for research on is blended learning effective in Ohio, we really don't know because a lot of us are doing blended learning, but in EMIS, it's just showing up that you're in a class. Even our flex credit. You got kids taking flex credit classes all over the place, but on their transcripts, it just shows up as Algebra 1 or it just shows up as a science class. So we need to create this category and have a definition with it. Um, secondly, we've talked a great deal with our friends at ETEC and our friends at Ornet about what is the required bandwidth that schools should have in order to have these opportunities for their students. I am extremely blessed. I'm at a school district that has exceptional wireless capabilities in all of our buildings and we can handle that, but there are a lot of places that don't. So another potential requirement would be that all K-12 buildings in the state of Ohio have a minimum bandwidth and have minimum connectivity. Uh, this discussion has kind of grown because as we look at blended and we look at the definition and students being able to do things at any time, at any place, at their own pace, it brings their homes into accounts too. So should we be saying it shouldn't just be schools that are connected, every community should have the opportunity to be connected. Um, and there are federal projects out there that may allow that to take place. But so that connectivity piece becomes a challenge and it becomes a focus for us. Um, and that's the infrastructure. One of our other charges, and I think those of us who um, have seen some of the Learn 21 work, um, there's an iLearns Ohio platform that is available out there. iLearns Ohio used to be the clearinghouse. It used to be, and it, I think it was created with the intent of a place that teachers could share digital content. One of our recommendations has the potential to be strengthening and broadening of the iLearns Ohio platform as a place where teachers and schools and individuals can share their digital content through a number of different platforms so that if you're doing something awesome at your high school, you can share it with folks in other schools. Um, Right now, if you go to the iLearn, if you go to iLearnOhio.org and search the platform, what you'll see is a really rating of third-party content that you could purchase. So it's really more of a clearinghouse for 
um, that pre-designed content. Uh, I believe there's a real push for there to be able to be shared content among teachers and among schools in this area. The other thing I learn Ohio has, and a lot of people don't know this, there's money attached so that students in um, economically challenged districts can take AP courses through I Learn Ohio free of charge. Um, that was one of the field leveling um, purposes when they put the I Learn platform there. Um, the money's there, they won't pay for you to take the test, but they will give you access to advanced placement courses through I Learn Ohio. Um, number three, talked a lot about professional development and pre-service teachers. Um, I've had the opportunity as a member of the task force to go to several diff different um, groups such as this, and you'll have the opportunity to hit me up with comments and questions later. And one of the things that is usually the first thing talked about is teachers need new skills to be able to do this. Um, we constantly pile on teachers and pile on teachers, and we've never given this professional development. Uh, we are fortunate that we have a member of the Board of Regents on our group, and um, I, I know sometimes it's Senator Cates, sometimes it's Chancellor Cates, um, takes those things back when it comes to pre-service teachers. What do we want our colleges and universities to be teaching our next generation of teachers when they come to us? As a sitting superintendent, one of my concerns is the teachers that are in our buildings. How do we find a way to get the time and the training in our already crowded day for teachers to learn these new skills. I am a true believer that technology shouldn't be a pylon. This shouldn't be something else we ask teachers to do. This should make lives easier. This should make work easier. This should take time away from grading papers to planning lessons, to finding resources. Um, so how do you provide that professional development and that time in the day for teachers to be successful with this? Uh, number four is research. I mentioned already, we need to be able to track what we're doing. U.S. Department of Education survey came out and it was mentioned in uh, the keynote address. Um, online and traditional in-seat learning is fairly comparable. The early research shows that blending learning provides better results. We need to be able to track this research in Ohio so that we can support this with our communities as we shift resources and reallocate resources to move in this direction. Um, Eligibility and equity. I think one of the most hotly debated topics we've had so far and that we'll continue to have is do we make it a graduation requirement in Ohio for all students to take at least one blended or online class? I know there are a number of states that have already done this. I think Georgia just did it last week. Um, it, it's a hotly debated topic in our group. Um, do we make that a graduation requirement? There are, some, there are some in our group who feel we have to do that to force everyone to move forward into blended learning or into digital learning. There are others who feel that it'll just become a box on a checklist. If you just have to give everybody a digital course as a high school graduation requirement, some school district will go purchase online health, they'll kill their health requirement, they'll kill their online requirement, and it'll just be a checked off box when those of us who are most passionate of, about this feel that it should become part of our DNA. It should become part of just what we do is using the most up-to-date technology in the most efficient manner to provide our students with these skills. So that's a really hotly debated topic. Um, awareness, there are a lot of people who don't know about the different options that are available. You hear online, you hear blended. Blended can be any number of things. I recommend if you haven't done a lot of blended research, pull down the Innosite report. They'll give you eight different models of blended, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, blended learning's a menu. Blended learning's a spectrum, and, and we need to teach people this. It's, it's about us bringing content to students where they are instead of forcing them into our boxes. And, and that's an education piece, and it's an education piece I struggle with as a superintendent in a high-performing school district when mom and dad want kids to have the same type of experiences that they had. And mom and dad know what high school looks like when they were in school. And unfortunately, it looks like when grandma and grandpa were in school. 
And as we have these changes, there are challenges, and part of that's educating our, educating our communities. And finally, we've talked about incentives. Um, eTech has two grants out right now for blended learning. If you go to the eTech website, I think they're still open, um, you can apply for those grants. Do we need to put incentives out there for districts to do this? Um, I, I know in a lot of places, this is budget. And the first start of dealing with your budget problems is taking a step in that direction. I truly believe we can do this, and it doesn't have to cost more money. It's just a reallocation of existing resources. But you have to be able to take that first step to get there. Um, so in short, those are the um, eight recommendations that I think are th at the tip of our iceberg that we're kicking around. Uh, we were supposed to, you know, we're tardy as a task force. Our recommendations were supposed to be to the legislature on March 1st. Um, with the shift from Dr. Summers from the governor's office to Dr. Ross from the governor's office, we have um, kind of been excused, I guess. We, we've got a late pass so that we can get this to the governor's office in the coming weeks. Um, I believe at our last meeting, Dr. Ross said that the governor wants some of these things by the mid-year uh, budget correction bill. Um, so I think we'll have some of the most agreeable recommendations quickly, and our hope is to make those available to school districts for the 2012-13 school year so that there is some flexibility immediately. Um, I know that Dr. Ross has insinuated that he would like us to continue um, as we dig into some of the more complex and challenging issues that we probably couldn't come to consensus at in two more meetings. So at this point, um, as I said, we've done this presentation several times and it's always provided some great insight. Um, so I'll open it up and answer any questions or take any suggestions that folks have at this time. Okay, so I'm talking as a superintendent now and not as the uh, member of the digital task force. Um, the amount of money that we spend on copies in our school district, we made nine million copies last year. Uh, we charge student fees for student handbooks, for workbooks. Um, our textbook budget in years when we have large scale adoptions can be in the half million dollar range. Um, I believe, and I've said to some people's chagrin, that um, I'd like to say we, we bought our last textbook series, that we'll be looking at digital content and curriculum as we move forward. It's things like Blackboard and things like Schoology and the learning management systems that will allow us to take what used to be paper, wor workbook, textbooks, and turn them into digital, evolving content. And I think this is why it's most important. It came in kind of our presentation this morning. Um, we might have some kids who use that and consume that digital content sitting with a traditional teacher five days a week in a classroom. We may have other students who consume that digital content two days a week in the classroom and three days a week with a more flexible learning style. We might have some students who consume that content 100% online where they consume the content is going to be where the students' needs are. And um, so I think as we work through this, um, that gives us the flexibility. The major, thing, the major barriers to that as a superintendent are the course design. Not all teachers are course designers. And finding the time to design the courses and the content. And then number two is the technology to get the content to the students. Uh, all of the different devices that we have uh, cost money. And to get to that point where, is it a bring your own program? Are you purchasing the devices? Is it a mixture? Um, I think those are some of the barriers, so. Such as? <laughs> Remind me. <laughs> Donna's talking in a meeting about how they change their cell phone policies. And so you had some oh. data on how many incidents. Yeah, last year in Loveland High School in the first semester, over 300 incidents with cell phone discipline. 
This year, we had like five, because we just let kids use cell phones now. In fact, five to 12, we allow students to carry their own devices. Um, the teachers control their classroom environments. We have some teachers who have those calculator slots hanging on their wall and the kids come in and they make the kids slide their cell phones in there so that they're out of the way. Other teachers will make kids put them on the desk. Some of them don't worry about it. Some of them use them. Um, the, the shift that we've able to make in something as simple as, in my assistant principal's here, the assistant principal's time in the high school from chasing down cell phones when mom and dad give them to kids, kids expect to have them. I believe we have a duty to teach students how to use this technology and not outlaw them from using it. Um, you know, the presentation this morning, 92% of kids when they go to college are gonna have to take an online course of some type. Shouldn't we be teaching them in our schools how to do that? One of my frust most frustrating things as a superintendent is when you get an email that somebody will put LOL in an email. And you're like, no, that's a text message. Shouldn't we be teaching our kids the different types of writing styles that they need to communicate in a 21st century world? There's things that you use in a text message. There are things you use in an email. There are things you would use in a formal letter that you attach as a PDF in your email. These are all different writing skills. These should be part of our English requirements. This, we should be teaching our students to do this. You know, how I communicate on Twitter is much different than how I communicate on my blog because I'm not limited on characters in my blog. Now, my readers might have a shorter attention span than I write sometimes, but it's probably why they follow my Twitter. But, you know, they're different styles. We need to teach our students this. Other questions? You can keep going. Oh, now I have a boom microphone. <laughs> Uh, in a model where you have teachers creating content, do you see a scenario where you'd have like um, a gate where it has to be approved as a certain level of quality and et cetera, and then it would be made available to the masses, or what's your model there? Uh, yeah, it would, it would have to meet certain standards. I've told our teachers that right now we use Apex, and I pay Apex to provide our content. I would much rather pay our teachers to provide our content. I would much rather our teachers be the ones designing that, but of course, I think that if we have Loveland content and we put the Loveland stamp on it, it's gotta be better than what we're buying from somebody else, and I think it can be, but this is the professional development side. This is the finding time side, and this is where things like Learn 21 make all the sense in the world, because if you're part of a consortium of other districts, and you could, over the course of a summer, get the six best algebra teachers from six suburban districts to design the content that we all then could deliver to our students. Don't we want the rock stars from all of our different districts being the ones to design our curriculum? Don't you want the best physics teachers from high performing schools to design content that can be consumed by kids in other schools? Because if I, have a if I have an above average algebra teacher and they're using rock stars developed content, now that above average teacher is performing at a higher level because the content was developed by a rock star. And the kids are all benefiting. A and I know in my conversations with Bill, and he's standing back there so I can talk <laughs> to him, I, I feel like we should make that available to other people. That's leveling the playing field in Ohio. That's allowing districts that might not have a rock star, that might be in a rural location, that might have a brand new rookie algebra teacher now we're giving that brand new rookie algebra teacher rich, complete content that can be delivered across the spectrum. So yeah, we need the quality control, but we also need to be able to pick the people who want to do it to be the ones to design it and to make it and to, to bring it to life. Uh, you don't want to force a teacher to develop content who doesn't want to do it. Uh, you want to allow that to happen organically among groups um, of high performers. In that iLearn platform currently, the only criteria that was authorized in the language originally is alignment to the academic content standards. So right now task force members have said we'd like to see some ratcheting up of the quality either using the Quality Matters Framework or the INA Coal Standards or ISTE Nets, something additional to alignment. 
So in that statewide platform, because John kind of spoke to a Learning 21 kind of sharing mechanism, to the extent that courses are being loaded into that platform today, their only criteria is the alignment. And we're going to be hit with something new when, it, when these end of course exams come out. So these are going to be living courses. They're going to be adjusted. How great would it be if your teachers, instead of spending their evenings and weekends grading things, could have them all graded for them and they can spend their weekends either with their families, which is going to make them better teachers, or developing lessons and, and figuring out how to adjust these lessons. The things that we can do through these learning management systems is a true transformation of how we function in our classrooms. And the challenge is being able to, to take that first step and, and move in that direction. We're just starting to move forward as a district with developing online classes and there's been some questions about who owns that content for teachers. If they go to another district, can they take that with them or is that our intellectual property? And that's a kind of a big discussion, I think, and that question needs to be answered as we're moving forward, because some teachers are like, well, I'm not gonna create this and let you have it if it's that good. You know, so we're in those discussions, and I don't know if you've all addressed that at all. Um, we've had, we've in started engaging in the conversations. I'm gonna tell you my personal opinion. I think you should own it, but I want it too. So that if teachers are developing content, and they're developing it in groups, or they're developing, developing it in part, I think if that teacher were to leave the district, they should have access to what they developed, but I also think we need it. You know, one of my concerns with purchasing some of the content that's available now through traditional textbook and curriculum providers is a lot of it expires. Um, if you were to purchase an online textbook for some, from some companies, it's either limited to a device or it's got an expiration date on it. And as we all know as superintendents, there could be a time when you run into a budget crunch when you stretch your textbook cycles. And in the old days, if you had paper books, sure, our history books still have Bill Clinton as president in them, but they're still books. Um, so as the superintendent, I want to be able to have that content housed with us, but I also want you to be able to have that part of the intellectual property yourself. If you're talking about equal access to bandwidth and connectivity, how about the learning management systems? Um, we've discussed a statewide learning management system, and I don't believe that that's a direction that anyone was necessarily comfortable in going. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I know that the conversation has come up. I also know that through partnerships like Learn 21, the consortium price from the learning management system is significantly reduced. There are also free learning management systems out there that if you create content that's SCORN compliant, should be able to work in multiple systems. You could take a Moodle course and move it to Learn 21. You could take a Schoology course and shift it to another learning management system. Now, this is in theory. It apparently isn't always clean. But as you develop this content, that's why I think if you look at groups of teachers developing this curriculum, you could have teachers developing it and using the same content in different learning management systems. If you're a Moodle district and we're a Blackboard district, we could develop the same stuff. Um, so it's the content that I believe is more important than the system. I also think it all needs to be cloud-based. Um, it all needs to be you look at the LMSs that are out there now, so many of them have great mobile apps. So many of them are able to be um, accessed on a plethora of different tablets, computers, even down to your iPod Touch. Um, the days of making something so it works in Windows are over. Um, it's got to be able to live on any of these devices. We had the pleasure of the Department of Education coming and walking us through the Park Consortium's vision for the tests that are coming. And um, one of the Park Consortium slides has a kid taking the assessment on a Nintendo DS. Um, does the device matter? 
And a lot of our traditional teachers are like, you can't have a kid take a test on an iPod Touch, because how are they going to type those answers? Well, a paragraph on an iPod Touch for some kids is nothing. They do it faster than they do on a keyboard. Um, so the LMS, in terms of at a state level, I don't think we're going there. But I do think from a superintendent's level, there are a lot of different opportunities for us to, to, to make this work. So I just offer one possibility. The iLearn platform um, for those courses could go with a state-sponsored LMS for a period of time, which would be about quickly loading people in that don't have anything. But the idea that task force members liked most of all was the kind of shared services co-op purchasing idea. And if it's good for content, it's good for LMS, it's good for mobile devices, it's good, you know. So th that was the idea that they felt allowed the most regional and local customization with the integrity of macro level buying power. So I got a question for you, and, I, and this is where it seems as though the, the state of Ohio likes to give us a lot of liberty in our school districts to make decisions. Uh, except where if, when EMIS comes into play, that's where you've taken the liberty away from us and you said, this is the way we want it. So not putting us in a box in a corner to say you need to do that LMS is providing that liberty for us to make those choices. And, and then as you described, Sarah, really say, okay, well then get together collectively and really work at it. So where do you might see those non-liberty for, for lack of a better terms, you know, where are those non-negotiables that you think you, the, the task force can help us? Where do you see the state helping us move forward? What do you think that one bubble to the top piece could be? Is it, is it that the state could really help us with quality matters or could it, are we not even gonna get into that? We're just gonna say we're just gonna stay away from that. I mean, if collectively, if you give us some non-negotiables, we can all huddle around that and say, hey, we can do that well together. And, and I'm, I'm going to speak now more from Bob's time on the task force than from Dick's, because Bob was a lot more vocal uh, about, I think the non-negotiable at the secondary level is going to be outcomes-based. There was significant conversation that was wrapped around the idea of funding secondary students per course and not per student. Um, I believe that when you look at some of the models Ohio tends to be following right now, they're looking at that flexibility of the student to not only take courses from local high schools, but from other providers on a per course basis. And this all would be outcome based. This all would be you're going to be assessed on this end of course exam this final exam and how you get there is up to you if you're being successful and if you look at the and again this is john talking now this is no one else talking if you look at the direction that a lot of things are going in ohio um, i don't have a crystal ball to look into to future funding formulas but it seemed like there was a lot of discussion about this outcome-based per course funding model. And if you're successful, go for it. And um, as a local control guy, I like that. You know, if you give the Loveland City Schools the opportunity to meet the challenge of an outcome, tell us where the bar is. I've told Stan Hefner before, if you let us take the Tim's test, if you let us take you know, any of those national tests, let us take them, we'll do it. Just tell us what you want. So, so much of what we're doing in Ohio is now predicated on where are the assessments because we want to shoot above those. And I think that will end up being the non-negotiable when it comes down to it. All right, well, thank you all very much. I'm going to, all right, and I don't know why mine's in blue. Um, <laughs> doc, Dr. Ross's email's there. My email's up there. Um, and feel free, if so, 
when we did this at the eTech conference, I got about eight to 10 emails with people saying, hey, I went home and thought about this. Have you thought about that? Um, as we have these conversations, uh, feel free to contact any of us. Um, if you Google search Ohio Digital Task Force, you'll get all of us. Um, it's exciting and it's hard work and uh, we keep pressing along and hopefully being able to open some doors to allow exactly what Bill talked about, that flexibility to uh, move forward. Thank you for the opportunity.